Welcome along fellow time travelers and strange historians. This time around we're going to be reading chapter 6 of The Elephant Man and Other Reminiscences by Frederick Treves. Written in 1923. Before I begin, please like and share this episode and subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. And check out the links below to learn how to support my research and productions. You can do that by becoming a member of my channel on YouTube and or becoming a member on Patreon. Uh, both of which is where I post exclusive content, so I'd appreciate that. Now, sit back. And pour yourself a cup of coffee, or a tankard of tea, or a mug of mead, or a chalice of cider, or a flagon. Fill with any beverage of your choice and join your fellow strange historians and me around the campfire. Chapter 6 A Sea Lover The man I would tell you about was a mining engineer, some forty and odd years of age. Most of his active life had been spent in Africa, whence he had returned home to England with some gnawing illness and with a shadow of death upon him. He was tall and gaunt. The tropical sun had tanned his face an unwholesome brown, while the fever-laden wind of the swamp had blanched the color from his hair. He was a tired-looking man who gave one the idea that he had been long sleepless. He was taciturn, for he had lived much alone and, but for his sister, had no relatives and few friends. For many years he had wandered to and fro, surveying and prospecting, and when he turned to look back upon the trail of his life, there was little to see but the ever-stretching track the file of black porters, the solitary camp. The one thing that struck me most about him was his love of the sea. If he was ill, he said, it must be by the sea. It was a boyish love, evidently, which had never died out of his heart. It seemed to be his sole fondness, and the only thing of which he spoke tenderly. He was born, I found, at Salcombe in Devonshire. At this place, as many know, the sea rushes in between two headlands, and, pouring over rocky terraces and around sandy bays, flows by the little town and thence away up the estuary. At the last it creeps tamely among meadows and cornfields to the tottering quay at the foot of Kingsbridge. On the estuary he had spent his early days, and here he and a boy after his own heart had made gracious acquaintance with the sea. When school was done, the boys were ever busy among the creeks, playing at smugglers or at treasure seekers, so long as the light lasted. Or they hung about the wharf, among the boats and picturesque glitter of the sea, where they recalled in ineffable colors the tales of pirates and the Spanish main which they had read by the winter fire. The reality of the visions was made keener when they strutted about the deck of the poor, semi-domestic coaling brig, which leaned wearily against the harbor side or climbed over the bulwarks of the old schooner, which had been wrecked on the beach before they were born with all the dash of buccaneers. In their hearts they were both resolved to, quote, follow the sea, end quote, but fate turned their footsteps elsewhere. For one became a mining engineer in the colonies, and the other a clerk in a stockbroker's office in London. In spite of years of uncongenial work and of circumstances which took them far beyond the paradise of tides and salt winds, the two boys, as men, ever kept green the memory of the romance abounding sea. He, who was to be a clerk beyond a pale-faced man who wore spectacles and whose back was bent from much stooping over books. I can think of him at his desk in the city on some day in June, gazing through a dingy window at a palisade of walls and roofs. 
The clerk's pen is still, for the light of the chimney pots has changed to a flood of sun upon the Devon cliffs, and the noise of the streets to the sound of waves tumbling among rocks or bubbling over pebbles. There are seagulls in the air, while far away a gray bark is blown along before the freshening breeze, and the only roofs in view belong to the white cottages about the beach. Then comes the ring of a telephone bell, and the dream vanishes. So would the man whose life was cast in unkindly lands. He would recall times when the heat in the camp was stifling, when the heartless plain shimmered as if it burnt, when water was scarce, and what there was of it was warm, while the torment of insects was beyond bearing. At such times he would wonder how the tide stood in the estuary at home. Was the flood swirling up from the channel, bringing with its clear eddies the smell of the ocean, as it hurried in and out among the piles of the old pier? Or was it the time of the ebb when stretches of damp sand come out at the foot of cliffs, and when ridges of rock dripping with the cool weed emerge once more into the sun? What a moment for a swim! Yet, here on the veldt there was but half a pint of water in his can, and a land stretching before him that was scorched to cracking, dusty and shadowless. It was in connection with his illness that I came across him. His trouble was obscure, but after much consideration it was decided that an operation, although a forlorn hope, should be attempted. If the disease proved to be benign, there was prospect of a cure. If a cancer was discovered, the outlook was hopeless. He settled that he would have the operation performed at the seaside, at a town on the south coast, within easy reach of London. Rooms were secured for him in a house on the cliffs. From the windows stretched a fine prospect of the channel while from them also could be seen the little harbor of the place. The surgeon and his assistant came down from London, and I with them. The room in which the operation was to be performed was hard and unsympathetic. It had been cleared of all its accustomed furniture. On the bare floor a white sheet had been placed, and in the middle of this square stood the operation table like a machine of torture. Beyond the small bed the patient was to occupy and the table set out for the instruments, the room was empty. Two nurses were busy with the preparations for the operation and were gossiping in whispers. There was a large bow window in the room of the type much favored at seaside resorts. The window was stripped of its curtains so that the sunlight poured in upon the uncovered floor. It was a cloudless morning in July. The hard work surgeon from London had a passion for sailing and had come with the hope that he might spend some hours on the sea after his work was done. His assistant and I were to go with him. When all the preparations for the operation were completed, the patient walked into the room erect and unconcerned. He stepped to the table and, mounting it jauntily, sat on it bolt upright and gazed out earnestly at the sea. Following his eyes, I could see that in the harbor the men were already hoisting the main sail of the little yawl in which we were to sail. The patient still sat up rigidly, and for so long that the surgeon placed a hand upon his shoulder to motion him to lie down. But he kept fixedly gazing out to sea. Minutes elapsed, and yet he moved not. The surgeon, with some expression of anxiety, once more motioned him to lie down. But still he kept his look seawards. At last, the rigid muscles relaxed, 
and as he let his head drop upon the pillow, he said, I have seen the last of it, the last of the sea. You can do what you like with me now. He had indeed taken, as he thought, farewell of his old love, of the sea of his boyhood, and of many happy memories. The eyes of the patient closed upon the sight of the English Channel, radiant in the sun, and as the mask of the anesthetist was placed over his face, he muttered, I have said goodbye. The trouble revealed by the surgeon proved to be cancer, and when, some few days after the operation, the weary man was told the nature of his malady, he said, with a smile, he would take no more trouble to live. In fourteen days he died. Every day his bed was brought close to the window so that the sun could fall upon him so that his eyes could rest upon the stretch of water, and the sound of waves could fall upon his tired ears. The friend of his boyhood, the clerk, came down from London to see him. They had very little to say to one another when they met. After the simplest greeting was over, the sick man turned his face towards the sea, and for long, he and his old companion gazed at the blue channel in silence. There was no need for speech. It was the sea that spoke for them. It was evident that they were both back again at Salcombe, at some beloved creek, and that they were boys once more playing by the sea. The sick man's hand moved across the coverlet to search for the hand of his friend, and when the fingers met, they closed in a grip of gratitude for the most gracious memory of their lives. The family man's last sight of the sea was one evening at sundown when the tide was swinging away to the west. His look lingered upon the fading waves until the night set in. Then the blind of the window was drawn down. Next morning, at sunrise, it was not drawn up. For the lover of the sea was dead. And so this concludes this episode of Strange History. I know it's kind of short, but don't worry. I've got another one coming right up after this one. Do me a favor and kindly like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell. If you want to support my research, please click on the link below to make a donation directly to me. Please join me on Patreon and as a member here on YouTube, where I post exclusive content. Please comment and leave a super thanks below. That really helps me out a lot. Kindly be kind to all non-human animals and please don't eat them. They don't like it. And please do yourself a favor and go to a local shelter and adopt a cat or a dog or both. You and they will be very glad that you did. Until next time, I wish you safe travels on all your journeys. Mm -hmm.